Okay, good morning. Um, my name is uh, Charles Gammy. I'm uh, from the University of Illinois. And uh, my assignment is to talk about uh, astrophysics of accretion disks. And, and since many of you are from the coasts or uh, perhaps overseas and may not know where Illinois is, um, I've provided a diagram uh, so that you can find us. Uh, we're, we're right about there. We can zoom in a little more using the miracle of Google Maps. Uh, so, so we're in the center of the country. Um, we, can, we can zoom in even further. Uh, here's our beautiful campus in the middle of the summer. Uh, and you should know that uh, University of Illinois is the home of uh, NCSA, which runs Exceed, which many of you have probably uh, used, uh, and also the home of uh, Blue Waters which is one of the largest academic supercomputers in the United States. It's also the home of HAL 9000 from 2001, okay, which is connected to astronomy. And if anyone's interested, I can tell you the story at coffee. Okay, so, uh, so the assignment is disk astrophysics. And uh, here's the plan. Uh, I'm gonna start out with some uh, phenomenological motivation. Uh, and uh, go through a series of, uh, a list of interesting uh, uh, disk systems that motivate uh, some of what I'm gonna talk about, and I think also motivate uh, many of the lectures that you've heard over the last week. Uh, then I'll go on and talk about disk evolution, which is all about evolution of angular momentum. Uh, and uh, I've, I've been told I have to Let's see, I have a pointer here somewhere. Um, I have to talk about the magnetorotational instability uh, and turbulence in disks. Uh, and then if there's time at the end, I'll, I'll give a, a brief discussion of current problems in accretion disk theory. Okay, so uh, first up, uh, a list of astrophysical disk systems. And again, the motivation here is that the disks, the takeaway message, is that disks uh, are at the heart of many of the most interesting problems in theoretical astrophysics. Okay, so uh, let me start with an incomplete list of uh, disk systems uh, ordered uh, according to, uh, with the exception of this, the central uh, object around which the disk uh, sits. Uh, and uh, you can see that there are, you know, we're, we're very familiar with uh, spiral galaxy disks, which uh, should not be excluded uh, from this list. They're, they're unique in that they're very well resolved disk systems, uh, and we can learn a lot from them uh, that may be relevant to uh, other disk systems. Uh, so, so, in particular, the, the disk of our galaxy uh, has a, a, a approximately thermal magnetic field embedded in the interstellar medium and has a uh, uh, hot gas layer which extends up kiloparsecs above the disk. And this may be a feature of other disk systems as well. Um, there are also cold and warm disks in elliptical galaxies. Um, as, as we now know, uh, there are black holes in the, the center of almost all those galaxies. Uh, which give rise to a variety of phenomena from very luminous objects uh, down to uh, very low luminous object, very low luminosity objects, like uh, the galactic center, the center of the Milky Way, Sagittarius A star. Um, there are also disks in uh, accreting stellar mass black hole systems when there's enough gas provided that we can, to the accretion flow around the black hole that we can actually see uh, the accreting black hole. And again, that gives rise to a, a variety of phenomena. Uh, neutron stars in binary systems uh, also produce uh, luminous disks. Uh, one of the best studied disk systems is the, the uh, dwarf nova system. So interacting binaries uh, with a mass losing uh, secondary or primary star uh, that produces accretion through a disk onto a white dwarf. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about an example of such a system in a moment. 
uh, protostars, protoplanetary disks, uh, like the famous HL Tau disk, uh, 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 also produce luminous disks, although in some cases the disks are observed uh, not because they're generating uh, energy through dissipation of, of internal turbulence, but because they are um, illuminated from, uh, by their central star. Uh, there are also disks around planets, of course, and the, the protolunar disk is an example, the one that formed the moon, uh, and debris disks, uh, such as Saturn's rings, which are not gaseous, uh, but which have uh, many other features of, uh, of uh, uh, disk systems, including, in the case of Saturn's rings, density waves, which are, are found in, in several of these uh, accretion disk systems. Okay, so, so let me talk about some specific examples. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the galaxy NGC 4258, uh, which is a, a fairly nearby uh, spiral galaxy. Um, this is a Hubble Heritage image, and uh, it looks like a, a fairly uh, regular uh, spiral galaxy, except there are a couple of features here which are seen, I believe this is in H alpha, uh, which were known for many years as anomalous uh, spiral arms. And it turns out that those are a feature that results uh, from emission of a jet from the nucleus of this galaxy. Okay, so if one zooms into the center uh, through about 11 orders of magnitude in angular scale, uh, one can observe using very long baseline interferometry a set of uh, water maser spots on the, the sky. So this is from a, a Nature paper from the late 90s. And uh, the spots uh, are here uh, on, on the uh, uh, receding side. Uh, there are a few spots here in the center and then there are a few spots here on the approaching side. And then the color here shows some radio continuum emission, which is also picked up uh, in the, the course of the VLBI observation. And, and the scale here, the physical scale, is about 0.1 parsecs to about 0.3 parsecs. So very, very close to the central black hole, uh, which has um, a mass of about four times 10 to the seven solar masses, measured very precisely uh, through these maser spots. So, so the measurement, uh, and this is from a, a more recent paper by uh, Humphreys et al., uh, is made uh, using the positions of the maser spots on the sky. Uh, it's made using the velocity of the uh, maser spots, which turn out to fall very precisely on a Keplerian rotation curve. So that tells us that this is a, a low mass disk around a central object. Um, and then, uh, and, and actually also a thin disk. Uh, and then one can also measure the acceleration of the central maser spots. And the combination of the acceleration, the velocity, and the, uh, and the angular positions on the sky allow one to infer the central mass and the distance to this object. So um, this turns out to play an important role this, this system turns out to play an important role in setting the, uh, the extragalactic distance scale and measuring the Hubble constant. So, so this uh, uh, allows me to introduce a, a first uh, dimensionless parameter for disks, which is the ratio of the scale height of the disk, the thickness of the disk, characteristic thickness h, to the local radius. And uh, in, in this system, that ratio is of order 10 to the minus three. So the, uh, uh, the ratio is proportional to the, the sound speed uh, in the disk divided by the rotational velocity. And we know that the sound speed is a, uh, of order of a few kilometers per second or a kilometer per second. And we can see that the rotational speed is of order 1,000 kilometers per second. Okay. So this is a, a proof of the existence of thin disks in, uh, in a resolved system. It's also an example of um, a system 
where the disk is not lying in a, a plane, as one might expect uh, in naive disk models, but just to go back to this illustration where there's a grid laid on top to guide your eye, uh, the, uh, the disk is made up of a series of rings which may be uh, tilted and warped. Uh, so the, the warp is quite well constrained here. So another important feature of disk systems, uh, warps. So thin disk, warped disk. Okay. Um, another interesting feature of uh, NGC 4258 disk is that it's, uh, we're, we're seeing the Maser disk far from the central object. So this far out, the uh, accretion energy dissipated per unit area in the disk is very small. And most of the heating of this disk comes from illumination from the central accretion flow. So, uh, so that's very important for understanding the, uh, the thermodynamics of the maser emitting gas. Okay. Yeah, that's a, so, so this, the story is that um, uh, you, you get maser emission along lines of sight where the velocity uh, is coherent along a, a significant path on the line of sight. And that happens at the so-called tangent points, so along the, the receding and approaching edge of the disk. Yet there's also maser emission in the center, uh, and that may be as a result of uh, seed photons for the maser produced by the jet that we don't see. Okay. Okay, next up is uh, the center of the galaxy. So this is a beautiful Spitzer mosaic of the uh, inner few hundred parsecs of our galaxy. Um, and uh, uh, if, if one zooms in, so here I have a, a galactic uh, center map here. Uh, which gives the scale of uh, things in, in units of GM over C squared, the size of the black hole. Uh, and, and we're out at here at uh, a few 10 to the 10 GM over C squared. This, that image you just saw is at about here. Uh, and then if you zoom in by nine orders of magnitude, you get to the, uh, the black hole. And uh, we know that there's uh, an accretion flow around this central black hole that produces millimeter wavelength emission uh, through synchrotron process. And uh, that synchrotron emitting accretion flow is a target system for the Event Horizon Telescope. So I, I saw Event Horizon Telescope mentioned in some of the notes, but I don't know if anyone got to talking about it. Can, have you, have you okay, very good. So Event Horizon Telescope is a, a millimeter VLBI experiment uh, so that will link together millimeter antennae from around the globe, the South Pole, Alma in Chile, uh, sites in Hawaii, uh, and elsewhere. And uh, it will be able to produce images of the accretion flow in the galactic center uh, and in M87 at the horizon scale. So uh, many people have been making models of of uh, these systems. And I'll show you one model that came out of our group uh, some, some years ago. Uh, so this, uh, this is a millimeter wavelength movie of uh, accretion onto the central black hole. So th this is a very interesting disk system. Uh, these resolved images, which won't be this nice, I, I you know, if, if anybody wants to discuss it, at coffee, I'm happy to tell you the saga of Event Horizon Telescope. But um, there will be information in the EHT images uh, about this accretion flow that will allow us to constrain uh, possibly the characteristics of the emitting plasma. Uh, so uh, where in the accretion flow is most of the emission produced around the jet or in the disk? Uh, what do the fluctuations in the uh, accretion flow measured by EHT tell us about turbulence uh, in disks. Okay, so, so this is uh, probably a collisionless plasma. Uh, so a, a plasma at temperatures of maybe 10 billion degrees 
uh, at very low densities, sort of uh, number density electrons around 10 to the 6. And uh, under those conditions, the mean free path to Coulomb scattering is very large. And uh, this, this allows me to introduce another dimensionless number, which is the Knudsen number, uh, which is the ratio of the mean free path to the scale of the system. And in Sagittarius A star, in our best models, this ratio is around 10 to the 5. So, um, uh, so this is uh, an interesting system for applications of uh, uh, work that Matt Kuntz and others are, are doing in, in studying uh, the evolution of turbulence in collisionless plasmas. Uh, this is also a system where the, uh, the Alphane speeds are, are relativistic. And uh, so it's, it's also a, a venue for applying relativistic MHD, uh, as you learned about from Lewis Lehner. OK, I've, I've got two more disk systems to go. Uh, so this is the famous uh, HL tau disk. Uh, HL tau is um, uh, a a nearby protostar, it's about 140 parsecs away, uh, that has been imaged in millimeter continuum emission by ALMA. And what we're looking at here is, uh, is, is thermal uh, millimeter emission from dust that's embedded, presumably, in a gaseous disk. Uh, so the central star here is uh, somewhat less than a solar mass, and the disk may be uh, perhaps uh, a tenth to a few tenths of the mass of the central star. And, and to give you a sense of the scale, I, I think the first uh, big dip in brightness here is at about 50 astronomical units. Okay, so, so this is a disk system uh, that may be forming uh, planets uh, and that may be gravitationally unstable. Uh, in addition, uh, cold disks like this one, so that the temperatures in, in, in these protostellar disks are governed by external illumination, so the temperatures are similar to the run of planetary temperatures in the solar system. So at, at 50 AU, the, the temperature is somewhat less than 100 Kelvin. Yeah. So these are, these are cold disks, possibly self-gravitating. So let me introduce uh, two more uh, dimensionless numbers. So one is the magnetic Reynolds number, which uh, allows you to assess the, the importance of uh, non-ideal uh, effects in uh, the, the plasma around uh, a young star or in other systems. And this is defined as the ratio of a characteristic diffusion coefficient, which is the sound speed multiplied by the scale height. So this is a, a something with the dimensions of a diffusion coefficient, uh, divided by the uh, resistivity. So this is the electrical resistivity of the, the plasma. And, and that's high in these systems because the temperatures are low and the, uh, the abundance of free electrons, of electrons in the gas phase, is low. OK, so it, it turns out that in uh, the regions of this disk that we can resolve with ALMA, it's likely that this magnetic Reynolds number is substantially less than one. And so, um, uh, so large parts of the disk may be decoupled from the magnetic field. Okay. Uh, the other important dimensionless number in describing uh, s systems like uh, HL tau is the uh, Tumre Q parameter, which measures the importance of self-gravity in the disk. Uh, so this, in a Keplerian disk, is the sound speed multiplied by the orbital rotation frequency um, divided by pi times Newton's g times the surface density, sigma, of the disk. And when this parameter is, uh, is less than or of order one, then self-gravity becomes important in the disk.
Okay, the final, final disk. Uh, so, uh, uh, most of you look at this and don't see a, an accretion disk, but when I look at this, uh, I do. I'm very interested in the, the problem of formation of the moon. Uh, and uh, as some of you probably learned in introductory astronomy, uh, the moon is thought to have formed from a collision uh, between an impactor and the proto-Earth. And uh, this impactor uh, hits, hits the Earth, and then lofts uh, material into orbit around the young Earth uh, that uh, uh, settles into circular orbits. And this is a, a SPH simulation of one of these collisions from Cook and Stewart. Uh, this is an unusual model with equal mass uh, impactors. And you can see, as time goes on, there's something really bad that happens. Uh, after the collision, and then things settled down after a few hours, and there's a disk of particles that uh, are color-coded here by temperature. So in this case, the temperature is around 4,000 Kelvin that are orbiting the young Earth. And uh, this is another interesting disk system where uh, the magnetic Reynolds number uh, may play an important role. So initially, the disk may have uh, zero coupling to the magnetic field, and later in its evolution, it may have uh, stronger coupling to the magnetic field. Okay, sorry, I have one more disk system to go. Uh, this is SS Cygni. So this, this, is, a, this is an artist's conception of uh, SS Cygni. SS Cygni is a dwarf nova system. Uh, so there's a, a companion star. Um, that is overflowing its Roche lobe and producing an accretion disk around the uh, primary white dwarf. And we, we now know that this uh, system produces a, a radio jet. Uh, but this system has been known for, for more than a century to be variable. And uh, this is uh, a light curve from the American Association of Variable Star Observers that goes back to 1900. So you can see uh, this system quiescent in the visible, uh, and then every few weeks it goes into an outburst and then decays. And uh, this has been going on since uh, William McKinley was president of the United States. And it will continue going on even if Donald Trump becomes president of the United States. <laughs> so, uh, so, so these outbursts are believed to be due to, I, I've just uh, uh, broken the Trump rule. It took me about 20 minutes to mention Donald Trump. Um, so, um, so these outbursts are believed to be due to an instability of the accretion disk. So it, it wants to accrete at a, a rate uh, that, at which there is no steady Disk, no stable, uh, steady disk solution for accretion from the outer edge of the disk into the surface of the white dwarf. And, uh, and as a result, it oscillates between an excited state where accretion is very rapid and a quiescent state where accretion is slow. And the, these are, are model disk systems in, in the, the sense that they change on time scales. Uh, that we can access easily with, with uh, observations. Uh, we can learn a great deal about these systems from eclipse mapping, so we can, uh, we can evaluate the, the run of temperature inside the disk uh, using, uh, for some of these systems, the passage of the secondary in front of the disk. Uh, so, so the time series of uh, brightness of the system as the secondary passes in front of the disk allows one to infer uh, the run of surface brightness of radius. Okay, so uh, to, to connect this to the, some of the topics discussed here um, in computational plasma physics, uh, this system may have a low magnetic Reynolds number when it's in quiescence. Uh, and it, uh, is probably MHD turbulent 
when it's in outburst. And uh, as I'll, I'll mention later, the convection that occurs in the course of the outburst may enhance the strength of the magnetic field uh, that we believe is present in the disk and uh, lead to enhanced transport of angular momentum. Okay, so, um, so that's a, a very uh, brief overview of disk phenomenology and some interesting uh, problems in, in accretion disks. Um, so you, the, the takeaway there is that disks are central to many interesting problems in uh, astrophysics. <coughs> so uh, now I wanna go on to uh, talk about disk evolution. And uh, uh, this is all about angular momentum. So disks are common in astrophysics because of a common physical process, which is that angular momentum is approximately conserved uh, while uh, internal energy of the plasma is easily radiated away. So the time scales for evolution of angular momentum are long and the time scales in many systems for evolution of the internal energy are short. And, and I have a, a little animation of this here. So, so let's imagine that we throw some uh, plasma into orbit around a central object, and it has some angular momentum, L, and some kinetic energy, and it's cold, so it has a uh, thermal energy which is significantly less than the kinetic energy. In, in the frame of the central object. Okay, so here's the animation. Okay, did you see that? Uh, so so there, there are shocks that are produced as the gas settles in to an orbit around the central object, and those shocks uh, change kinetic energy to uh, thermal energy. The kinetic energy is dissipated. Uh, then, over time, the thermal energy is radiated away while the angular momentum is approximately conserved. So here's my next animation. Okay. And then finally, uh, the thermal energy becomes quite small compared to the kinetic energy of the disk in, in orbit about the central object, and we have a, a thin disk. Okay, so th this happens in, in uh, many systems in astrophysics in NGC 4258, perhaps in uh, the protolunar disk in, uh, in Saturn's rings uh, in, in uh, many, many places in astrophysics. Okay, so because of this, this disk evolution, understanding disk evolution is all about understanding the evolution of the disk angular momentum. Okay, but before I go on to that, let me just uh, review uh, some time scales for uh, disk equilibrium. So um, in a thin disk, uh, the uh, dynamical equilibrium is reached on a time scale of order the dynamical time. And the dynamical time is characterized by the uh, orbital frequency omega uh, of, the, of the plasma in orbit about the central object. And that orbital frequency is approximately the Keplerian uh, orbital frequency for a disk which is not substantially self-gravitating, uh, plus a correction which is only of order h over r squared. So for uh, a protoplanetary disk, for example, which has h over r of order one-tenth, that correction to the orbital frequency is only of order one percent. Okay. Uh, the disk also settles into hydrostatic equilibrium in the vertical direction and uh, that uh, allows us to estimate the, uh, the scale height h that I introduced over there. And uh, I, I won't derive this, but the, the um, scale height is proportional to the sound speed divided by the rotation frequency. Okay, so this in a, a gas pressure dominated disk so a disk like a protoplanetary disk where the pressure is dominated by the gas pressure as opposed to a disk close to a black hole that's accreting rapidly 
where the pressure is dominated by radiation pressure. Okay, then uh, in gas pressure dominated disks, the sound speed is proportional to this square root of the temperature. Okay. All right, uh, so, so the dynamical equilibrium is achieved on of order of the dynamical time. Um, although, let me just give a, a caveat to that. So it's possible uh, that there are long-lived excitations of the disk. Uh, so it can be eccentric. Uh, so it, it's, it's possible instead of having circular orbits uh, around the central uh, object to have eccentric orbits. Um, although to, to lowest order in the eccentricity, that doesn't change things very much. Uh, and then, of course, as we saw in the NGC 4258 disk, it's possible to have uh, tilts and uh, warps of the disk. Okay, so uh, the, the next uh, piece is thermal equilibrium. Uh, so this is entirely analogous to what you learned in stellar structure. Okay. So it's a, the same set of, uh, of models that apply to, or the same set of equations basically that apply to disk equilibrium. So thermal equilibrium is achieved when the heating rate is balanced by the radiative cooling rate. Okay, so the, the heating uh, in uh, some disk systems is dominated by, by internal friction uh, related to dissipation of turbulence. And uh, uh, unlike uh, stars, that is not concentrated at the center of the disk. Uh, that dissipation may occur throughout the vertical extent of the disk. And, and the best evidence is that it does, as I'll show you later. Uh, so that is, an uh, equilibrium is balanced by the radiative cooling. And in an optically thick disk, that's just given by sigma t effective to the fourth at the surface of the disk, so just like a star. Okay, so that equilibrium is achieved on the thermal time scale, and we can characterize that according to the rate at which uh, energy is dissipated in the disk. And I, I'm now gonna introduce uh, this alpha parameter, uh, which is uh, very important in uh, disk theory, which describes the intensity of turbulence inside the accretion disk. So the, the heating rate is simply assumed to be proportional to the local dynamical time. And uh, the constant of proportionality is alpha. And, and so this is almost definitional. So the, the thermal time scale is of order the thermal energy content of the disk, which is, again, this is the surface density of the disk, so grams per centimeter squared, multiplied by the square of the sound speed, so the temperature. Uh, and uh, this is of order alpha omega minus one. So alpha, this parameter which describes the intensity of turbulence in the disk, uh, is believed to be uh, somewhere between a tenth and a hundredth uh, uh, in many systems. So this is substantially long, if that is the case, then this is substantially longer than the time scale on which the system reaches dynamical equilibrium. Okay, um, the, the final time scale uh, is known as the viscous time scale, and that's the time scale on which uh, inflow equilibrium is reached. So you can imagine feeding mass into a disk at the outer edge, and then having it gradually make its way inward toward the central object um, at some rate. And as time goes on, uh, it may set up an equilibrium where the inflow rate is constant at every radius. And um, uh, that happens on this uh, viscous time scale, which turns out to be longer than the thermal time scale by of order r over h squared. So again, to go back to the example of protoplanetary disks, uh, this might be a factor of 100 longer. Okay, so, so that describes uh, disk equilibrium. So the next step is to go on and ask how disks evolve over time. So the analogy here is to stellar structure and stellar evolution. So these, this is the stellar 
structure or disk structure model, and then the next step is uh, evolution. And uh, because this is all about uh, angular momentum conservation and angular momentum evolution, uh, the governing equation is derived from an equation uh, that uh, describes the angular momentum flux inside the disk. Uh, so I, let me just go through and explain uh, what everything is in this equation. Um, so we start with uh, what's being evolved here. So on the left, uh, sigma again is the surface density grams per centimeter squared uh, in the disk. So the, the column vertically integrated, the density vertically integrated through the disk. Uh, omega is the uh, orbital frequency uh, and kappa is the epicyclic frequency. And so just to remind you, the epicyclic frequency is the natural radial frequency of oscillation uh, in uh, a central potential, uh, uh, cylindrically symmetric potential. Uh, so in a, a Keplerian disk, in a disk around where, where the potential is dominated by the central object, uh, kappa is equal to omega. Okay, R is the cylindrical radius here. Um, w R phi is a shear stress. So this is uh, a quantity uh, that tells you what the, um, uh, what the radial flux of azimuthal momentum is. So this is a component of the stress tensor, radial flux of azimuthal momentum, which obviously is connected to the radial flux of angular momentum through a factor r. Okay, so that appears under a second derivative here. Okay, so this is, this is integrated vertically through the disk, so one calculates uh, this off-diagonal component of the stress tensor inside the disk and then integrates it vertically. Okay, next up is uh, this, this parameter tau here, which is connected to external torques. Um, so uh, external torques can be uh, imposed on the disk. It can lose uh, angular momentum vertically by direct extraction uh, in a magnetized wind. Uh, it can have torques applied locally by non-axisymmetric gravitational fields. So that all can be captured in this e external uh, torque. And then finally, uh, there is uh, uh, mass loss or gain, either through loss of mass in a wind from the surface of the disk, or gain of mass through infall from outside. So infall onto the disk, uh, might happen in a protoplanetary disk system where there's a remnant envelope around the, uh, the young star. Uh, winds are observed in systems like SS Cygni in, uh, in spectral lines from the disk. Okay, so, so this is the disk uh, evolution equation. Um, the, uh, the full derivation of this is an exercise for the student. So if you want to work in disk theory, you should do this calculation. And uh, it's, it's actually not that difficult. Uh, you start with uh, the equation of angular momentum conservation. Um, you assume that the disk is orbiting in circular Keplerian orbits. So the angular momentum per unit mass is fixed. And then you, uh, you use conservation of mass as well. Uh, and then the only hint I would, additional hint I would give here is that the, this factor, kappa squared r over o omega, comes for, just from the radial derivative of the angular momentum per unit mass. Okay. okay. So, um, so the big question, the big questions in disk theory are what give rise to what gives rise to this uh, shear stress and what gives rise to this uh, external torque. Uh, now, uh, this 
turns out to be possibly a global problem. In other words, to understand, um, let's say, magnetic torques on the disk, you have to understand the global evolution of uh, magnetic fields in and around the disk. And that turns out to be a very difficult problem that is just now becoming accessible with the largest scale simulations. Um, this may be a little bit easier uh, in the sense that it may be possible to study the development of turbulence in uh, little patches of the disk. This may be a local problem. And, uh, and from those, uh, those local analyses, uh, one might be able to derive a model that uh, allows integration of this piece of the disk evolution equation. Okay, so the, the standard um, model for disks uh, is the alpha disk model. And you, you really can't uh, understand anything that's happened after alpha disks were introduced in the 1970s without understanding a little bit about what alpha disks are. So these guys were introduced in uh, a paper by Shakura and Sinyaev in 1973 and in a paper by Lyndon Pell, Bell and Pringle in uh, 1974. And the idea is to adopt a simple scaling argument for that shear stress in the disk evolution equation. And uh, one way of thinking about this scaling argument is to imagine uh, that the turbulence can be modeled as a, that the effects of turbulence in the disk can be modeled as a viscosity. Uh, but a, uh, not a microscopic viscosity, but a, a, a viscosity with a very large coefficient related to the eddy size of the turbulence and the uh, scale of the eddies. So uh, in this model, you have a turbulent viscosity nu, which uh, is just this alpha parameter again, which describes the intensity of turbulence multiplied by something uh, with the characteristic dimensions of a viscosity. So viscosity has dimensions of a diffusion coefficient, which is a length times a velocity. And uh, the natural velocity scale is the sound speed in a thin disk, and the natural uh, length scale is the scale height. So we introduce a turbulent viscosity of order alpha times Cs times H. Uh, and then in the classical alpha disk models, one ignores the effects of external torques, and one ignores infall winds and possible variations in the alpha parameter. So, uh, so it's the simplest possible uh, disk evolution model. So we've thrown away most of the terms in that disk evolution equation, and now we just have one left. And you can see uh, there's a this shear stress in here, which is gonna be somehow related to the surface density, okay? And that appears under two derivatives, two radial derivatives. Uh, and then on the left, it's related to the time variation of the surface density. So this looks like a diffusion equation. Okay. So in the alpha disk model, one assumes that that system, sorry, I should have said this, one assumes that uh, the disk is in a steady state so that the surface density isn't changing and this thing can be set to zero. Okay, so here's a list of what goes into formulating the uh, alpha disk model. So first of all, one assumes a thin Keplerian disk, so the parcels of gas are orbiting as rings around the central, orbit, uh, central object with uh, orbital uh, frequencies of order the Keplerian orbital frequency. Uh, one also assumes that the disk is in vertical hydrostatic equilibrium, and that leads to this relationship between the scale height and the sound speed and the orbital frequency. So in the frame of the disk, if you, if you go out into the disk and, and ride with the plasma as it orbits around the central object, uh, you'll see that uh, vertically the disk has a, a harmonic potential. And so the, that harmonic potential confines the plasma into the thin uh, disk. And uh, by solving equation of hydrostatic equilibrium, uh, one finds this relationship. Okay, 
the, the next step is to understand the thermal equilibrium of the disk. And to do that, one has to balance the heating, which is related to dissipation of turbulence, against the cooling, uh, which in uh, the alpha disk model is related to vertical diffusion of uh, vertical radiative diffusion of energy. Okay, so in order to do that calculation, one needs an opacity. And the classic thing is to uh, use an approximate opacity where the, uh, the Rossland mean opacity is assumed to scale as some power of the density and some power of the temperature. Uh, then uh, we have the, the turbulent viscosity, which controls the heating rate in the disk. Uh, we have a prescription for vertical integration of the density. So the surface density is approximately related to uh, the volume density uh, multiplied by two times the scale height. So this is a crude uh, integral. Uh, and then an estimate for the optical depth from the surface of the disk to the center of the disk. So uh, surface density times kappa, the opacity, is the uh, uh, optical depth to the center of the disk from the surface. OK. So uh, to finish the radiative equilibrium, we need the, the surface temperature. Uh, so the effective temperature is uh, assumed to be equal to the total energy dissipated by turbulence inside the disk, and that's related to the viscosity and the shear rate. Uh, uh, so this is one of these omegas gives you the viscous stress here. Sigma nu omega is the stress. Multiplied by the rate of strain, which is omega, gives you the total rate of dissip dissipation per unit area. Um, so uh, this gives you an estimate for the surface temp temperature. Uh, and then radiative equilibrium tells you how the uh, uh, energy diffuses out from close to the midplane of the disk. And that relates the effective temperature at the surface of the disk to the uh, central temperature at the midplane of the disk through a factor of the optical depth. OK, and there's a wrong factor of sigma in here. So this is not dimensionally correct. Uh, but you can mentally cross that out. So, so T effective to the fourth is approximately T central to the fourth divided by tau. So if the optical depth is large, the uh, central temperature of the disk is large compared to the surface temperature. OK, and finally, in a steady state, uh, one finds that the accretion rate is related to the shear stress by, uh, by this equation, which arises from the disk evolution equation. So this is a consequence of that. OK, so that's, that's a lot of estimates um, that uh, I, I haven't justified very carefully. But let me show you the outcome. So as, a, as an example, uh, consider a steady state disk around a stellar mass black hole. And uh, uh, in these alpha disk models, one divides the disk into zones, radial zones, according to the uh, dominant opacity close to the midplane of the disk. And uh, uh, for a, a disk which is accreting uh, close to the Eddington rate onto a stellar mass black hole, that the innermost zone has radiation pressure much larger than gas pressure, and electron scattering dominates the opacity. OK, so one finds that the temperature, uh, the central temperature of the disk is, is four, uh, 40 million uh, Kelvin. Uh, and then there's a scaling here uh, with alpha with the mass of the, the central object in units of a solar mass and with the radius x cast in units of gm over c squared. So, um, uh, so this gives the run of central temperature in the inner region of the disk. This gives the run of surface density in the disk, so 0.4 grams per centimeter squared, uh, with a scaling in terms of alpha and a scaling in terms of the mass accretion rate in units of the Eddington rate. 
Okay. And, and uh, uh, finally, a, a scaling of h over r with radius. Okay, so what I've done for you, in case you didn't follow all the details of what I just said, is provide you with a Mathematica script that Peter is gonna make available, I think, on the, the, the web, it's already there. Uh, and you can run this Mathematica script and obtain a general alpha disk solution uh, for, for any system with any mass uh, as long as you provide a suitable scaling for the mass of the central object and a suitable scaling for the accretion rate. Okay. Uh, so, so in that you will see explicitly what opacities uh, one might use for uh, these, these disk estimates and you'll see explicitly the, uh, uh, the estimates that I've quickly gone through here um, for uh, equilibrium of the disk, thermal equilibrium and hydrostatic equilibrium. Okay, so um, back to the disk evolution equation. Um, so, uh, the, as I said, the, the big questions here are what are um, the, sh the shear stress, what, it, what provides the shear stress in disk, what provides the external torque, and what might be the inflow and outflow rates. So part of this is answered uh, through studies, local studies of turbulence in disks. So let me go on and uh, talk about uh, turbulence in accretion disks. So again, this is important in relation to the classic alpha models because the alpha disk model po posits this, the existence of this turbulent diffusion of uh, angular momentum, and the question is what generates turbulence? And uh, there are many live possibilities in 2016. So one possibility is uh, the magnetorotational instability, which I'm gonna discuss in, in some detail next. Uh, another possibility is gravitational instability. So in, uh, in uh, disks around supermassive black holes in galactic nuclei, the uh, tomb rate Q parameter, which I wrote down over there, drops close to one inevitably as one moves out in the disk for any accretion rate. So uh, gravitational instability is relevant to the outer parts of uh, active galactic nuclei uh, accretion disks. It's also relevant to massive uh, uh, T Tauri disks or, or protoplanetary disks. Okay. Uh, there are a couple of other possibilities, or three other possibilities, which are related to fluid dynamical instabilities, which are known to exist in, uh, in accretion disks. So uh, one is the so-called zombie vortex instability. Uh, and this is work that's come out of uh, Phil Marcus's group uh, at Berkeley, uh, Joe Barranco, Phil Marcus. Uh, I think it's, it's still a little bit controversial, uh, and uh, there, there are recent papers which critique the, uh, the robustness of the zombie vortex instability um, by Geoffroy Lesseur and, uh, and others. Okay, so uh, this is an instability which generates vortices in unmagnetized disks, and then uh, it's possible for those vortices to shed uh, spiral uh, sound waves that carry angular momentum, that exchange angular momentum uh, between radially separated parts of the disk, uh, and uh, that might lead to a non-negligible alpha. Uh, the vertical shear instability here is um, connected to uh, the, the possibility that uh, the orbital frequency varies vertically inside the accretion disk. And in that situation, there's a, a, an instability of uh, incompressible waves that uh, shear like this with a period comparable to or larger than the orbital frequency and that, that grow 
uh, and saturate as, uh, uh, as sound waves, which again can transport angular momentum. And then the subcritical baroclinic instability uh, is an instability that arises out of work by Hubert Klar many years ago uh, and is uh, uh, related somewhat loosely to the baroclinic instability that drives weather uh, on the surface of the Earth. Okay. So I can't cover all these topics, so I'm going to focus on the magnetorotational instability. Um, and uh, the magnetorotational instability uh, was discovered in the context of Kuwait flow, magnetized Kuwait flow in the 1950s by a Russian scientist named Velikov. Uh, so Kuwait flow is uh, a laboratory, laboratory flow uh, between rotating cylinders. So there's a fluid, uh, there's an inner cylinder, there's an outer cylinder, they rotate at different rates, uh, and there's a magnetic field embedded in the Kuwait flow. Um, so uh, this was known to, well, to Velikov, to Chandrasekhar in, uh, so, so this instability is described in uh, Chandrasekhar's book on uh, hydromagne hydromagnetic and hydrodynamic uh, stability. And, but it was not realized that this instability might occur in accretion disks until the early 1990s when Balbus and Hawley uh, studied this and discovered that there is a local instability of uh, accretion disks. So local here means that uh, the presence of the instability doesn't depend on boundary conditions in the disk. Uh, it occurs on a small scale inside the disk that can be treated and it can be treated in the WKB approximation. Uh, it's an instability of weakly magnetized disks. So one doesn't need a strong magnetic field present for the instability to take off. And it turns out that the instability is, itself is driven by exchange of angular momentum between radially separated fluid elements. So it's ideal for driving turbulence in uh, disks that can lead to uh, angular momentum evolution of the disk. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna start with uh, a simple, and actually finish, with a simple mechanical analogy for the magnetorotational instability, um, which involves two masses on a spring. So let me... Uh, Can people who are sitting over here see this board? Yeah, okay. Okay, so the, the system we imagine is uh, two masses um, connected by a spring in orbit around a central body. And for simplicity, I'll just consider the case where uh, the potential is dominated by the central body. And so the orbital frequency is given by the Kepler orbital frequency. Okay, so we have two masses and we have a spring that connects them. And then there's a characteristic frequency associated with the mass spring system, uh, which I'll call gamma. So um, uh, this simple model, which uh, was first described in a paper by um, Balbus and Hawley, captures essentially all the important features of the, this uh, magnetohydrodynamic instability without an extended calculation. So the analogy here is that the masses can be thought of as fluid elements orbiting in the disk, and the spring can be thought of as a magnetic field which connects the fluid elements. Uh, and then the bending of the field lines uh, produces this restoring force which is modeled 
by this uh, character characteristic frequency gamma. Okay, so um, I have to um, start by setting up uh, a co-orbiting frame. Okay, so let me draw an even bigger version of this here. Uh, so I'm gonna set up Cartesian coordinates, which are co-orbiting with these two masses in a circular orbit around the central object. So the, the, I'm gonna orient the x direction uh, along uh, the radius vector, and I'm gonna orient the y uh, axis along the direction of orbital, or against the direction of orbital motion. Okay. So I can then write down the equations of motion in this local coordinate frame. And these equations of motion are known as the, the Hill equations or the local model equations. Okay, so let me do that next. Okay, so the separation of one of the masses from the center of this coordinate system is x in radius, and x double dot is equal to minus two omega y dot um, plus three omega squared x minus gamma squared x. Okay, so the fundamental assumption I've made in writing down this first component of the equations of motion is that the separation of these masses is small compared to the local uh, radius. And you can see uh, that this uh, might arise from the Coriolis force in this rotating frame where x is oriented along the radius vector and continues to be oriented along the radius vector as a pair of masses orbits around the central object. So this is Coriolis. This is the tidal expansion of the effective potential in the rotating frame. Okay, so there's uh, one half omega squared r squared uh, describes the centrifugal component of the potential in the rotating frame. And then there's uh, minus gm over r uh, which describes the gravitational potential, and combined, uh, uh, and then expanded uh, in a Taylor series expansion, one finds this term. So this tends to produce separation in the radial direction. It corresponds to tidal stress. Okay, the second component of the equation of motion in the toroidal direction, in the direction of uh, motion, is the other piece of the Coriolis force. And then again, the spring term. So the spring term wants to restore the masses back to their original position. Okay. So again, Coriolis, tidal expansion, and spring, which represents the effect of magnetic fields. Okay, so um, as, as a first uh, go at this, we can ask what happens if we turn off the spring and say, what, what are the modes of this mechanical system? So we set gamma to zero and then assume that x and y scale is e to the minus i omega t. Okay, so this is a linear system, so it, we'll, we'll find a relationship between um, this frequency and the orbital frequency at the end of the day. Okay. So, um, Okay, 
So the, this equation becomes minus omega squared x equals minus 2 omega times minus i omega y plus 3 omega squared x. And the second equation becomes minus omega squared y equals 2 omega times minus i omega x. OK, so I can solve this equation for x, and I can solve uh, this equation, uh, and then insert that into this equation. I obtain a linear equation in x, so the x's cancel out, and I find a, a dispersion relation that relates the frequency to the orbital frequency. And that gives you omega squared uh, is the non-trivial mode is omega squared is equal to the orbital frequency. Okay, so this is a very boring result. It tells you that if you perturb the system, it oscillates at the natural frequency in the orbital plane. Okay, so the next step is to turn back on the magnetic fields. And you can see exactly what is uh, going to happen uh, mathematically. So we'll add on an additional term here, uh, minus gamma squared x minus gamma squared y. And again, we can perform the same uh, simple algebra and solve for uh, the dispersion relation. And uh, that is a good, that's a good exercise for the student. The result is the following. Omega fourth minus omega squared So um, this tells you, uh, it turns out that there's, there's an instability. And you can see this by considering the limit that omega is small. So looking at the marginal stability limit. And then you can see that there is a marginally stable situation when gamma is of order omega. Okay, so this term vanishes when gamma squared is 3 omega squared. Um, so that means there's a zero frequency solution at that point, and that there's a transition uh, from stability to instability. Okay. So uh, let me just plot this up. So the single parameter here is the orbital frequency, sorry, sorry the spring constant squared divided by omega squared. And uh, there's one, two, four. Can, can you see this in the back, or am I writing too small? I see, I see some yeses. All right. Um, and then on this axis, I can write omega squared over the orbital frequency squared. Okay. And Uh, there, there are two sets of modes here uh, relating the, to, uh, produced by the two roots of the quadratic equation in omega squared. And one is the spring motion, which is what you would get if you just turned off the orbit. So the spring wants to oscillate at the natural frequency gamma. And then there's a second set of modes uh, which have zero frequency when uh, gamma is small, and then grow like this. And let's see, I'm, uh, need to redraw this. Okay, so omega squared is, is negative in this region when gamma squared over omega squared is less than three, as was indicated by my earlier argument. 
Uh, and if omega squared is less than zero, then we know that there's an instability. So there's an ex exponentially growing mode. Uh, an imaginary, uh, th there's a, a growing and a damped pair of modes. Uh, and the, uh, the fastest growing mode can be had from uh, just analyzing the, the roots of this equation. And one finds that this occurs at gamma squared over omega squared is 15 sixteenths. And that at that point, the minimum uh, in omega squared, which corresponds to the fastest growing mode of the instability, is uh, nine, nine sixteenths omega squared, or minus nine sixteenths omega squared. Okay, and then as the uh, spring constant grows stronger, uh, this, this mode eventually uh, becomes stable. And then when the, the spring is very, very strong, it doesn't feel the orbital dynamics at all. It doesn't care about the orbital dynamics. And uh, it just oscillates stably. OK, so, so this is uh, directly analogous to the MHD problem. So let me. Describe that here. So let's zoom in on the disk and consider a small patch of the disk uh, in the poloidal plane. So the, the radial direction is this way, vertical direction is this way. We're looking at a cut through the accretion disk. And we imagine that the accretion disk is penetrated by a weak uh, magnetic field. Uh, this instability corresponds to an oscillation or an unstable oscillation that looks like this. So there's one parcel of plasma at this height in the disk which is coupled to another parcel of plasma lower down in the disk by this magnetic field. And the, uh, the, the field resists bending. And the characteristic frequency of that bending is gamma squared is k dot va squared. Okay, so k is the, the vertical wave vector, or it's the, the the wave vector of the perturbation. And VA is the Alfane speed. So just to remind you, VA is B on root 4 pi rho. OK, so, so this is the Alfane frequency. And uh, the Alfane frequency squared is what substitutes for this spring frequency when one goes from the mechanical problem to the MHD problem. And so everything I've written down over here carries over if one simply substitutes k dot VA for gamma. That gives the dispersion relation for uh, a vertically oriented magnetic field, weak magnetic field in an accretion disk. Okay, are there any questions on that? Okay, so um, let me give a, a list of facts uh, about what's known about the linear theory of this magnetorotational instability, because obviously this is not a rigorous theory, and this only considers a special case where one has a, a vertical field uh, in the disk. So um, it turns out that for a general central potential, uh, Instability only requires that d omega, d, d omega squared dr is less than zero. So there has to be differential rotation, and the rotation frequency has to decrease outward. 
uh, the maximum growth rate in a Keplerian disk is, as you could deduce from this, where I said the minimum in the dispersion relation is minus 9 sixteenths omega squared, is in a Keplerian disk, three quarters omega. So the maximum growth rate is always the dynamical uh, rate, and it's obtained by tuning the wavelength of the unstable mode uh, so, for, so that for a given magnetic field strength, uh, this k dot Va is of order omega. So for example, if the field is very, very weak, then the characteristic wavelength at which one obtains the maximum growth rate becomes smaller and smaller. Okay. Um, the fastest growing mode, as it says in the next line, is when k dot Va squared is 15 sixteenths om omega squared in a Keplerian disk. Uh, we know that there is a, a local instability. So local here mathematically means uh, an instability that appears in WKB theory, uh, where the wavelength is small compared to the disk scale height. Um, and we also know that there is a form of local instability present even for a purely toroidal field. So in that case, the linear theory becomes quite a bit more complicated and, uh, and the instability manifests as a, a, a temporary uh, growth in the magnitude of the perturbation, which eventually stops. But by tuning the parameters, the wave vectors, it's possible to get as large an amplification factor as one wants uh, for any given toroidal field. Okay, so linear theory is great, but it doesn't tell you what happens when uh, the instability goes into the nonlinear regime and saturates. So for that, uh, we need simulations. Uh, so there's, there's lots of work been done on the development of MHD turbulence in disks over the last uh, 20 years, 21 years. Um, so, uh, the saturation of the MRI has been in investigated in local or global settings. So a local setting is one that basically uh, follows a patch of plasma as it orbits the central object and uh, uses a set of equations uh, inspired by the Hill equations. Uh, whereas global models consider the full evolution of the disk from the central object um, outward. Um, MRI simulations in literature can be stratified or unstratified. So the, uh, the stratified models simply include the harmonic uh, potential around the uh, midplane of the disk and so have uh, variations in the density uh, with height. The unstratified models turn that off and provide a simpler, cheaper model which may or may not be relevant. Uh, models have been run with explicit dissipation. So for example, explicit and small viscosity, microscopic viscosity, uh, and explicit and small omic resistivity. Um, or uh, in the majority of models, one uses something called aisles. So I, I don't know if anyone's talked about aisles here. No, okay. So uh, this amounts to which, what's called a direct numerical simulation of turbulence. So you simulate the entire uh, turbulent cascade from the largest scale uh, where energy is in injected, it scales comparable to the disk scale height, down to the dissipation scale. So you, you follow absolutely everything. Uh, in an IELTS model, uh, which means an implicit large eddy simulation. There's a closure uh, which provides dissipation, and the closure is provided by your numerical scheme. Um, so most models uh, to date have used aisles, and this, this may or may not be a problem. We know that the convergence properties of aisles and uh, explicit dissipation models are different. So I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, 
Okay, and then uh, people have looked at isothermal disk models. So isothermal just means that uh, one uses this equation of state where sound speed squared is a constant. This is the pressure, this is the density. Okay. So this eliminates the energy equation from consideration and gives one a cheap uh, model to integrate. Uh, now people are doing energetically self-consistent models. So either models with very little radiation uh, that allow heating uh, from dissipation of turbulence or uh, models which include radiative transport. Okay, so let me show you just a couple of models. So the first one is uh, a global simulation uh, that is stratified. It uses aisles. So uh, people sometimes describe this as dissipation on the bare grid. Uh, and it is energetically self-consistent in the sense that in this model there's uh, very little radiation and the entropy of the plasma is allowed to increase. So uh, this particular model is, uh, was run by uh, my, my student, Hotaka Shikawa, uh, who's now at CFA. And uh, it shows the density evolution in the midplane of a disk around a rotating black hole. So you can see that uh, there is sustained turbulence in the system that produces variations in the density in the midplane, and that these variations in the density take the form of trailing spirals. Okay. Um, so, uh, again, the color here shows a uh, log of the density, and this guy more or less reaches inflow equilibrium. In other words, it's been run through the viscous time scale out to a radius of about 20 times the event horizon radius. Okay. What's the weird, that's the boundary. Uh, so there's an outflow boundary here and uh, uh, there, there's some interaction with the boundary. We, we know that it doesn't make much difference to the outcome because we tried moving the boundary and we get the same result. Um, okay, so, um, so the next simulation I'll, I'll show you is uh, a local model. Uh, so it, again, it uses equations of motion which include uh, a Coriolis term and a tidal expansion of the effective potential in a co-orbiting frame. So we go into the frame of the plasma as it orbits around the central object. Uh, the model that I'll show you is stratified, so it includes the vertical gravity. Again, it uses aisles, or the bare grid, no explicit dissipation, and this one is isothermal. So, so here's a, um, a nice graphic from Geoffroy Lesseur uh, that explains a little bit about what this local model is. So we, we pick a box that's co-orbiting uh, with the plasma around the central object. And then we use a set of boundary conditions called the shearing box boundary conditions, which allow us to incorporate the differential rotation in the disk. So it's really almost periodic boundary conditions, but the way in which the radial boundaries are connected is time dependent and shearing. Okay, okay so here's, um, uh, the evolution of the model. So on the left, uh, this shows the density, and on the right we see the, the Y or toroidal component of the magnetic field. And, and these are integrations done by my student Ben Ryan recently, this, this spring. Okay, so um, you can see that uh, there's something going on in this disk. Uh, there is uh, turbulence which couples to compressive modes and produces these density waves that run back and forth inside the disk. Um, let me show the, uh, the field. Uh, you can also see that there are small scale structures in the magnetic field. And uh, uh, these lead to an alpha 
of order of a few times 10 to the minus 2 when vertically integrated through the disk. Okay, so these are just examples. There are, I think there are hundreds of papers which have looked at uh, these uh, similar models in the literature. Uh, and a few things have been learned from these. Uh, not as much as we'd like, a few things. Uh, so going way back in history, the first models that people ran were axisymmetric models. And we know that uh, even in axisymmetry, the MRI leads to a turbulent state and, uh, and that that turbulent state transports angular momentum outward. And that statement that angular momentum goes outward is not a trivial one because there are some forms of turbulence which transport angular momentum inward. So, uh, so that's interesting. Uh, we know that in 2D, the MRI does not converge. In other words, even if you have infinite numerical resources, uh, you will not find a converged value of alpha. Um, we know that uh, in 3D, the MRI leads to turbulence, and again, outward transport of angular momentum. Uh, and we know that sometimes in 3D, the MRI simulations converge. So we know they converge when explicit dissipation is used. Uh, we also know they converge when uh, in one of these local models, one inserts a vertical magnetic field uh, inside the box um, or a permanent toroidal field. So in either case, the simulation uh, converges. We know they don't converge in the unstratified Shearing box models on a bare grid in the Isles uh, problem. We, uh, there was something that was discovered by Framang and Papaloizu. Uh, we know uh, that there are issues with convergence for IELTS models in the unstratified shearing boxes. And we also know uh, that in the global models that have been run to date, the characteristic scales of the turbulence are not very well resolved. So one can measure a correlation length for uh, density and magnetic field structures, and those correlation lengths tend to be, uh, tend to change as the grid scales change, as the resolution changes. So, uh, so the news there is mixed. Uh, we've also learned that the intensity of the turbulence depends on several things. Uh, so in particular, we've learned that it depends on height in the disk. So let me show you uh, the run of alpha, which is the, in this case, is the ratio of the shear stress to the local pressure. Okay, so this is the run of shear stress to local pressure in the, one of the local models I just showed you as a function of height through the disk in units of the scale height. And you can see that uh, at the midplane here, alpha is about 0.01. And then as one goes up, away from the midplane, alpha increases. And uh, a couple of scale heights above the midplane, it's a few tenths. So th this is quite interesting and was not envisioned, I think, in the original um, alpha models from the 1970s. Question. Yeah. Um, well, so I think those are the same thing here. So it's, it's CS, the sound speed divided by omega. And in this simulation, uh, the equation of state is isothermal. So that may be what you're, yeah. Um, so this is an isothermal model. So they're the same. Sorry, what's? So, so that H over R does not appear as a parameter in the local model. So you've sort of expanded it away. Uh, and uh, because you've done that, the local model becomes very simple. There's no curvature present. Uh, everything is rectilinear, a uh, uh, Cartesian Shearing box. Okay, 
So we also know that in addition to depending on height in the disk, alpha depends on the magnitude of the vertical magnetic field that threads the disk. Um, so this, uh, the, the sense of this dependence is that as one increases the strength of the vertical magnetic field, the intensity of the turbulence increases. Um, and this, this may be connected to some of the outburst activity that's seen in, uh, in possibly in dwarf novae uh, in, and in X-ray transient systems. So uh, transient active disks around stellar mass black holes. Um, we know that alpha depends on the magnetic Reynolds number. I'm just about finished here, so you can get your coffee in a moment. Uh, we know that it depends on the magnetic Reynolds number in the sense that if you turn the resistivity up too high, it kills the turbulence, so alpha goes to zero. And, um, and that's relevant to uh, protostellar disks, which are poorly ionized and have low electrical conductivity. Um, and it may also be relevant to dwarf novae disks and uh, X-ray transient disks and quiescence. Uh, we also know that alpha depends on the magnetic Prandtl number. Okay, so that's, um, so the Prandtl number, magnetic Prandtl number, is the viscosity divided by the resistivity. And this viscosity is not the turbulent viscosity, it's a microscopic viscosity. So um, uh, the, the sense of this is that for the modest Reynolds numbers that are accessible in simulations with explicit dissipation, the uh, alpha tends to increase as the magnetic parental number increases. Okay, so I think I've run out of time to talk about current problems in disk theory, uh, so I'll, I'll end there, uh, thanks.